Just for those of you who don't know, Syngenta, um, we're the world's largest uh, crop chemistry and seed company. Um, so many of you have, have heard of some of our competitors, uh, like Bayer, BASF, uh, Monsanto. Um, so we have about uh, 27,000 employees. We operate in about 96 countries. Um, here in Asia, we operate across 14 countries and uh, have sales in the region of around about $2 billion across uh, both seed and, and crop protection. What I wanted to do just briefly, we talk, talk about sustainable agriculture. You know, people seem to think that it's rather ironic that a, a seed and pesticide company would, uh, would care to talk about sustainable agriculture. But let me not put too fine a point on it. Without sustainable agriculture, we don't have a business. We are in the business of farming. It is absolutely in our interest to make farmers as sustainable uh, as they can possibly be. And so we invest a great deal of time and money in trying to come up with uh, sustainable agriculture solutions for farmers. We spend around uh, $1.2 billion a year on R&D, and a lot of that is aimed at how can we make smallholders in particular uh, more competitive <coughs> and more sustainable? Because if we think about the challenges of food security and indeed sustainable agriculture, um, there are around about 400 million smallholder farmers in the world. Compare that to around 20 million largeholder farmers. And if you think about the challenges of food security and sustainable agriculture, those 400 million uh, smallholder farmers will have to increase their productivity by around about 200% in order to achieve the food security we need in 2050. Compare that to a large old farmer where the yield improvement is around about 20%. So there's a significant challenge for smallholder farmers. But in order to um, you know, ensure sustainable agriculture and sustainable agriculture practices, I think it's very, very important, and a lot of the messages you've heard over the last couple of days have been very clear around the need to give farmers access to technology, so getting the technology into the hands of farmers, and a lot of that comes down to government policy. So it's not that the challenge isn't actually developing the technology, the challenge isn't actually doing the R&D. The challenge is getting that technology into the hands of the smallholder farmer. And most often, the thing that gets in the way of that is bad government policy. Well, not so much bad government policy, but ill or poorly designed government policy. The second is around transferring knowledge. Uh, Farmers can have the technology, but unless they understand how to use that, they can't engage in more sustainable agricultural practices. The third is about linking farmers to markets. Because you can have the technology, the farmer can have the knowledge and engage in sustainable agricultural practices, but unless he can obtain a return on that investment for those practices, he, he can't continue to live. And so you know, ensuring access to markets and creating those those linkages is extremely important. I think it's often underestimated in the context of sustainable agriculture. And then the fourth is how do we scale up? So how do we get to those 400 million smallholder farmers? So how do we take a project that might work with 20 farmers or 200 farmers or 2,000 farmers and get that into the hands of 200,000 farmers and 2 million farmers? And that's the real challenge. Thanks. So, you know, the, the, the farmer's world is very, very complex, and I think it's extremely important when we start to talk about sustainable agriculture that you put yourselves in the shoes of the grower. Um, now, that might seem like common sense, but it's not, not necessarily an easy thing to do. But if you think about it as a farmer, what does the farmer want to do? The farmer simply wants to grow the best possible crop he or she can and get the best possible price for the output. But in order to achieve that, there are a lot of things going on on the farm, before the farm, and after the farm that we have to take account of. So in terms of before the farm, you know, what's happening in our space, in the R&D space, in terms of new product developments? You know, what variety should, should the farmer choose to grow? What should be his, his, uh, you know, his rotation practices? What sort of chemistry should he use? Should he be organic or traditional? I mean, these are all challenges and questions that the farmer needs to consider. Um, you know, how's he going to get his product to market? All of these things are going on in the farmer's mind before he even puts the crop in the ground. And of course, once he puts the crop in the ground, um, you know, it's under threat from the moment it goes in the ground until the moment it's harvested. And the most vulnerable time for a crop is the first 30 days when it comes out of the ground. You know, and, and it's being exposed to just about every sort of disease and insect um, you know, that, that, that can possibly try and attract uh, sorry, attack that crop. So 
how do we deal with that? And then how do we protect that yield in the last 60 days or 70 days of the crop? So you know, a lot of it comes down to technology, but also agronomic practices and understanding you know, the what we call the agroecological environment in which the farmer seeks to grow the crop. And then of course afterwards, you know, I don't know whether you, you're aware, but around $10 billion of produce is lost post-farm gate in the India agricultural supply chain through poor storage, lack of cold chain, uh, poor infrastructure in terms of moving products to market. So how do we get the products to market? And you know, when we talk about getting the best possible price, if we can give growers access to storage, for example, they can hold the crop and get a better price. So these things are all important. So it's very, it's crucial to understand this environment if we want to talk about sustainable agriculture. And you know, what we as an organisation have tried to do is move down this notion of what we call integrated solutions. So thinking more like the farmer in terms of growing the best possible crop. And as a technology company, you can see you can get more and more integrated solutions which lead to more sustainable agricultural outcomes. Now the first part of that is what we call integrated pest management. So looking at the, the, the insects that or the diseases that are attacking the crop. Um, you know, how can we use beneficial insects, for example? How do we manage resistance um, to, uh, you know, to, to, to chemicals and, and, uh, and traits in, in the crop? So that's the very first stage, and that's where people tend to focus. But I think if you talk about sustainable agriculture, you have to move further through the process. So you start to move into integrated crop management, so a more holistic approach to the agricultural and agronomic systems. So there you start to talk about looking at different growing systems. You start to think about managing residues. We had a lot of discussion yesterday about uh, overuse of fertilizer. How can we manage that? How can we reduce um, the use of fertilizer? How can we reduce the use of chemistry uh, in growing a crop? Um, looking at seed treatments. So uh, you know, how do we treat the seed before it goes into the ground? And very, very importantly, product stewardship. And this is often underestimated in terms of sustainable agriculture. An example of, of um, of uh, fertilisers, but also uh, in terms of uh, chemistry runoff and so on. All of these things are very, very important. So teaching farmers how to use the products correctly is extremely important in terms of sustainable agricultural outcomes. And then we move into things like um, you know, field margins, creating environments for pollinating insects is extremely important. Um, and then you go on to managing the entire agricultural landscape. And I think if we are serious as an organisation about sustainable agriculture, then we have to think about managing the entire agricultural landscape. Um, so, you know, what is the role of agricultural technology? Well, we see it playing three very, very important parts. The first is about protecting the yield, so protecting what you already have. So that's looking at how do we control weeds, how do we control pests, and the use of new, newer technologies, and I'll, I'll come to seed treatments in a moment. Once you've protected the yield, then the next focus is about how do you actually increase it. So uh, you know, where can you get to in terms of better breeding techniques, the use of uh, new traits, how do you help crops deal with stress, and in particular their drought. Uh, salinity is a very, very uh, important challenge here in the, in the Mekong Basin. So how do we help, uh, you know, through breeding and through the use of chemistry um, to, to increase the potential yield that is available. And then once you've maximised the yield, if you like, then what you start to focus on is the quality. And that's particularly the case in rice, for example, where rice is much more like a vegetable than a, than a cereal grain because people are worried about the colour, the texture, the taste, the hardness of the grain. All of these things are about quality. Uh, and so we look at things like you know, the introduction of hybrids, very, very challenging here in Thailand. Um, you know, can we look at the taste of vegetables? How do we extend shelf life, for example? How do we make a, uh, a, a vegetable be able to sit in the supermarket longer, particularly if we've got inadequate uh, cold storage? And then you know, we also look at things like the, the, the quality of malt that goes into barley, which makes beer. Uh, so you know, all of these things are important areas of focus, but only after you've protected the yield, maximised the potential, then can you start to focus on on quality and all of these things are important when you start to think about sustainable agriculture. So just to really, I just want to share with you three very quick examples of, of what technology can do in terms of uh, driving sustainable agriculture. Um, now this, uh, this image is not digitally altered. Um, you can see there the, the crop on, uh, on, your, uh, on your right has been treated with a seed trick. So all that is is coating the seed before it goes into the ground with an insecticide which allows the seed 
to, or the, or the crop to be protected from the moment it comes out of the ground. What we've also found is it actually helps with plant vigour. So you can see the root system there of the plant on the right is much, much longer. Now why is that important in the context of sustainable agriculture? Because that means it can use moisture more efficiently. It can draw moisture from lower in the ground. That's very, very important. Um, and you know, it's actually what we've, what we've found in developing this product, it acts like a paracetamol for the plant. So it helps the plant deal with stress more effectively. Um, a project we're undertaking in Vietnam, where we're working with uh, the government uh, and NGO sectors and also other private sector players, what we did was we looked at uh, growing systems for potatoes in upland areas of northern Vietnam and we found that growers were being constrained because they could only grow one crop a year. So through introducing new varieties and new agronomic techniques, what we've been able to do is help those growers now move to two crops a year. So you can imagine the benefit that comes from that. You've effectively doubled their income immediately by looking at agronomic practices, the way in which they farm, trait and variety selection. Um, and you know, where we started with a very, very small trial of, of, of three uh, different plots, you know, that is now being scaled up to uh, um, a much larger operation and we continue to work with the government and the NGO sector in order to shift growers to these newer farming techniques. Thanks. Um, a couple of projects we're also doing uh, under the World Economic Forum. So this is about the scaling up and getting technology into the hands of growers. Um, a coffee project in Vietnam where we're working with um, the Rainforest Alliance in particular. You can see there that we've, uh, we've gone from 50 plots in, in 2012 to uh, 120 demo plots in, in 2013. And again, it's about variety selection and agronomic practices. And we're seeing yield increases of between 30 and 50 percent. And then um, a new corn project in, in Indonesia, again, working with the government, with NGOs, uh, with uh, other value chain players like Nestle. And you know, the aim is there to treble yield, again, through variety selection, better agronomic practices, better farming techniques, and linking growers to markets. And we're very confident that we can, we can deliver that. And we're doing a similar project in, in corn in Indonesia as well. So these are about bringing the different players in the value chain together to try and focus on delivering better outcomes for, for the farm. Thanks. So very quick, I appreciate that. I'm happy to take any questions and talk about some of the other projects that we're doing. But just to reinforce, you know, green technology, when we talk about green technology, it is about delivering sustainable agricultural outcomes. That's about increasing the efficiency with which you use inputs and managing the various resource constraints that you have. It's about getting technology into the hands of farmers. It's about connecting farmers to markets. It's about transferring knowledge. And it's about how do you scale up effectively. And you start with small projects and bring value chain players together. Um, and the barriers, quite simply, inadequate R&D, so governments have an important role to play. The inability to transfer knowledge and, again, access to markets. Thanks very much.